I want to uh, quickly, and it will not do any of them justice to introduce the panelists to you. Uh, you know Shivananda Khan, who will start off, who is the founder and chief executive of the Nas Foundation International, focusing on male-male sexualities and HIV across South Asia, providing technical and institutional support and assistance to MSM groups, organizations, and networks in the region to develop their own HIV and sexual health services, rapid scaling up of service coverage towards universal access, addressing stigma, discrimination, and criminalization, along with promoting good practices. Now hear this. He is also the chairperson of the Asia Pacific Coalition on Male Sexual Health, and in 2005, he was awarded the Order of the British Empire in the 2005 New Year's Honours List of the British Queen for his services in HIV prevention, well, I couldn't resist, and care, and care with men who have sex with men in South Asia. Ladies and gentlemen, His Excellency Shivananda Shah. Where are the South Africans here? Who's from South Africa? You have no South Africans here? It's all your fault that I'm hobbling around, falling in your country. How do I follow this guy? Easily? I think you make a very nice queen, too. Uh, <clears throat> and since my camel knees are very worn out, I can't get on my knees to receive my honorary award <clears throat> from the appropriate position. Anyway, Stephen, thank you very much for your kind words. And I'm very sorry. I'm first here because, as it says in the Christian Bible, the oldest shall be first. So age before beauty. Uh, I'm the dinosaur in the room because I go back to 1969, before many of you were born, in the old days of the Gay Liberation Front. I don't know. How many of you remember the Gay Liberation Front from the 1960s? Nobody. Oh. Good old days, no? Before HIV, when we used to wear those big broad shirts and long hair and beetle ties and what have you, marching for lesbian and gay rights, equal rights. Um, in my position living in the UK at that time, it was on racism and class in the lesbian and gay communities because sometimes we forget to look at our own discriminations within our frameworks as well, and we need to remember that. And then, God, that was 40 years, five years ago, and I'm still looking cute. So, I'm staying in this hotel, and my room number is, and I'm available. And you know that, what they say about aged wine. Anyway, we were fighting in the 60s and 70s to be heard. To be heard. Remember that. Then, of course, HIV comes. And some of you got, most of you seem to have got engaged in the struggle to be heard because of HIV. But don't forget the institutional memory that a lot of the processes and the ways forward are on the shoulders of people who fought in the 60s and 50s for equal rights for lesbian and gay men. <coughs> and much of what we've achieved today rests on their shoulders as much on your shoulders as well. And I first started work in the UK uh, because South Asians were considered very good people. We get married, we have children, we go to the temple, we go to the mosque. We never do these bad things that all of you seem to do. And so the British just felt that we didn't need to have investment on HIV because we were not going to catch HIV because we were very good people. We soon proved that they were wrong. Not because we're catching HIV, but we had like to have a lot of fun. <clears throat> anger. What moored me back in the 60s and 70s was anger, that we were not being listened to, that our rights as human beings were not being respected. What got me angry in the 80s and the 90s was anger again. Now, anger can be very, a very negative thing or it can be a very useful thing. I noticed when Stephen was giving his comments that his body language was very angry. 
It was a form of a righteous anger. For those Christians who are here, I'm not sure how many there are, or even the Muslims who are here, remember that scene in the temple when Jesus Christ, I'm not a Christian by the way, just thought to get that straight. When Jesus Christ goes into the temple and gets very angry <coughs> at the way the temple was being abused by the moneylenders. I suppose donors can be seen as moneylenders, no? You should go on to get angry at the donors too. It's a righteous anger. And if you don't have that in our hearts, often it's very hard to motivate ourselves constantly for 40 years for me. To be motivated all the time to respond to the growing, if not increasing rates of homophobia that is now being experienced in Africa and some parts of Latin America and some parts of Asia, as much as the numbers of people who are still dying from a virus that we know how to deal with for the last 25 years. This is nothing new. We have known since the days of San Francisco how to deal with this virus. <coughs> and yet, still, there are millions of us living with HIV. There are thousands, if not millions of us, dying. Not because we don't know how to deal with it, but because our governments, our donors, our institutions don't want to deal with it. You know, UNAIDS and UNDP and WHO and UNIFEM and UNFPA, suddenly they've discovered MSM. No? Isn't that true? Isn't that true? Five years ago, where were they? I don't remember where they were five years ago. And you, and Stephen, and all of these guys here, we fought so hard to say, we want to be heard. This is not a new slogan. It's 40, 50, 60 years, 100 years old. Jesus Christ, I'm not going to be around in 100 years' time. But let's, let's agree what we need. Okay, so they're at the table, finally, maybe, perhaps. I'm not quite sure about ILO. Is the International Labour Organization at the table? No, not yet. UNIFEM? Okay, so they're finally coming to the table because they're now listening to what we have to say. Hopefully, but remember that that is process is not institutionalized. It's still key individuals. If Jeff O'Malley had not gone to UNDP two, three years ago, would UNDP take the lead on MSM? I doubt it very much. We are still reliant upon key individuals. One of our battles is now to institutionalize that these institutions maintain that integrity even when these key individuals leave. We never know when they're going to die or have a heart attack in the middle of a blowjob or whatever. You know? <laughs> well, it's me. At my age, I've got to be very careful. <laughs> slowly, dear, slowly. Slow down. <laughs> the, the, okay. What is the key problems that we're facing today in, our, in all regions of the world? I come to you because we have, we, I believe that NFI, my organization, is the first community-led MSM HIV program, multi-country, regional program, that the Global Fund is going to, fu going to fund. Quite a few million dollars we're going to have through the Global Fund, and we're the first. But it was hard work. Three times we attempted this. We need money. Four to five percent is the level of investment on MSM and HIV in this planet where you saw this morning 19 times more at risk than the general population, four to five percent. It's outrageous, and you should be outraged. How dare they treat us like this? Tragic. And on top of that, nine out of 10 of us don't get any services at all. Nine, 90 percent of our brothers and sisters have no access to services. That is genocide by any other name. Is that not genocide by any other name? They're killing us by ignoring us. It reminds me, I'm sorry I'm in Austria right now, but it reminds me of World War II when they arrested thousands upon thousands of lesbians and gay men, put them into work camps and killed them off. This is just a longer process. We have to find ways of addressing stigma and discrimination. Michelle was extremely optimistic and wonderful in this, this new universe. Everything is changing in the world. But we saw Sam say something totally different. 
and we deal with this. India has maybe, maybe changed Section 377, the law. It's going to the Supreme Court. Supreme Court has to make a decision. Not yet quite repealed. We've still got another hurdle there. In Pakistan, they have the Sharia and the civil law. In Afghanistan, they have the Sharia and the civil law where we can still be killed for being who we are. We have to figure out ways of engaging with government without creating even more problems for ourselves and more rests. We are constantly being asked to behave responsibly when the societies that we live in treat us as we have no worth, we have no power, we have no dignity, so why bother? Why should we behave responsibly in the societies that treat us so irresponsibly? So we need more money, we need more coverage, we need more knowledge, and Stephen is right, this stuff that Chris was talking about is an excellent way of getting more knowledge. But we need more than just epidemiological data. We need sociological data, we need anthropological data, we need ethnographic data as to how different communities of MSM and transgenders and gay men and hijras and kothis and katois and bakla and waria, all the different names, how they live their lives, how do they make their own decisions. <coughs> in terms of their own risk behaviors. We don't have enough knowledge about that. <coughs> and so, one of the reasons why I think the Global Fund got engaged with us, <coughs> can I have some water? Can you help me with some water? <coughs> this humidity is killing me, you know? You know, I lost my suitcase, so I had no clothes to wear. So I thought, should I come here without clothes on, or <laughs> what? But in this humidity, I think being naked is a much more sensible option. Uh, okay, I want to end up very quickly because there's other people to speak and they need their rights. <coughs> we formed coalitions. Coalitions with UNDP, with uh, international NGOs, with our partners in different countries. We came together to work together. A very diverse network of, of partners. And that seemed to somehow work. But we need to do it on a broader scale. We need to engage with family and reproductive health programs, with women's rights, with lesbian and gay rights, with government rights, with every police rights. The reason why the Afghan government is interested in investing in MSM and HIV is not because they have vulnerable MSM, it's but that the soldiers and the police were vulnerable to HIV from their male sex workers. They didn't care about us, they cared about soldiers. The Global Forum is a very key institution in this <coughs> because it brings together a wide variety of stakeholders from you and me to folks like Stephen, Mandeep, and a lot of other institutions so that we share a common platform. And I seriously believe now, after 40 years of engagement, that we can no longer shout at each other over the wall. You know, act up days in Paris and New York and London where we chained ourselves to railings and all that of this. How many of you remember chaining yourself to these railings back in the 80s? One. Oh God, we are old, no? Two. Four. Those days are over. It's the day of dialogue. It's the day of sharing and networking, building coalitions. And the Global Forum and the Asia Pacific Coalition and AMSHARE and ASICAL in Latin America, that's the way forward and where we can engage in multiple discussions with multiple stakeholders to come together and join hands in our common struggle, which is based on human rights for all. Not just MSM, gay men, transgenders, whatever, but for all. This is not a struggle that will end in a few years. You, as the next generation, carry that vision forward. It's up to you. I don't expect to live out the end of my days with that vision and that dream being true. But I'm hoping that you, as you end your next generation's days, that vision is true. I leave that dream with you. Thank you very much.